Your Excellency Sheikh Thani bin Hamad Al Thani, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and good evening. As president of the Middle Eastern Studies Student Association, known as MESA in short, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Georgetown University in Qatar for the opening of our seventh annual undergraduate research conference. MESA is one of Georgetown's student-led initiatives that provides a platform for undergraduates to showcase their work, recognizes their academic efforts, and encourages ongoing research in the region. This year's selection includes undergraduate student projects that demonstrate a strong academic research potential in the fields of economics, politics, and social affairs. They will be sharing their work with the wider community all throughout tomorrow's proceedings. Please join us during their respective presentation sessions to support their efforts and provide them with feedback. But before going any further, I'd like to take this moment to say a few thank yous. Um, I'd like to thank our faculty advisor, Dean Kyanrick Bart, for his constant encouragement and support. I'd also like to thank Heya Thani and Yara Al Kahala, this year's vice presidents, as well as all members for this year's MESAS team for their consistent dedication and commitment towards the organization of this conference and its vision. This year, our focus is on uncertainty, stability, and cohesion, elements through which we attempt to track and understand the continued transformation of the Middle East. One of the most influential mediums that aims to capture this transformation is indeed media. Thus, we are honored to have with us today a panel of highly esteemed media experts that have been investigating, documenting, and reporting on the region for many years. We look forward to hearing their insights on the undoubtedly prominent role media has played in the Middle East. And without further ado, I'd now like to welcome the Dean of Georgetown University in Qatar, Dr. Ahmed Dallal, to introduce our panelists and give his opening remarks. Your Excellency Sheikh Thani bin Hamad Al Thani, dear guests, colleagues, and students, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the seventh uh, MESA research conference at Georgetown University in Qatar. Founded in 2012, the Middle Eastern Studies Student Association, MESA, is a GUQ Georgetown University in Qatar student body which aims to provide a dynamic platform that allows students to present their work on Middle Eastern economic, social, and political issues. Every year, MESA organizes an annual undergraduate conference on Middle Eastern affairs, where students from around the globe present their undergraduate research on the Middle East. MESA also publishes a flagship peer-reviewed undergraduate journal on Middle Eastern Studies, the Journal of Georgetown University Qatar Middle Eastern Studies, Studies Student Association. And the journal presents undergraduate research concerning the Middle East through conference papers and independently solicited as essays. Through these activities, MESA serves as Georgetown's flagship undergraduate research platform connecting thoughtful undergraduates with leaders from academia as well as the private, public, and non-profit sectors within and beyond the Middle East. The theme of this year's conference is uncertainty, stability, and cohesion, a transforming Middle East. All day tomorrow, students from universities in Qatar and the United States will present their research on various topics related to this theme, and I encourage you to participate in this important event to the extent that you can. Uh, but before uh, I introduce tonight's panelists who will open this conference, I would like to thank the organizers of this event and conference, including our event department, Amanda, and all the event department, but above all, our inspired and inspiring students who organized and will participate in this event, especially this year's Massacre committee members, Wissam and Yara and Haya. Uh, Wissam is uh, majoring in international economics, and Yara is majoring in international economics as well, and Haya in international politics with a certificate in Arab and regional studies. Now it's my privilege to welcome the distinguished participants in tonight's opening panel, Al Jazeera's role in the transforming Middle East. The first participant is Clayton Swisher, who's a journalist and author currently working as the manager of investigative journalism uh, for the Al Jazeera Media Network in Doha. 
He is the author of two non-fiction books on the Arab-Israeli conflict and is the head of Al Jazeera of the Al Jazeera Investigative Unit and has done some very interesting work. This is our first speaker. <laughs> the second speaker is uh, Jamal Shayal, uh, a senior correspondent for Al Jazeera English who joined in, the, uh, in 2006 as its first Middle East editor. He covered a number of major stories, including the 2010 Gaza flo uh, flotilla and the 2011 Arab Spring. His exclusive reports include uncovering secret documents from inside Qadhafi's intelligence uh, headquarters and uncovering torture and human rights abuse inside Egyptian prisons. So please welcome. Our third speaker is Foliba uh, Thibault. Am I saying the name correctly? Oh, yes, okay. Uh, who's a broadcast journalist for Al Jazeera English, where she is a senior presenter of the flagship program News Hour. Prior to joining Al Jazeera, uh, she worked for France uh, 24, uh, uh, France 24, where she served both as anchor and correspondent. She hosted a segment entitled The Week in Africa. Uh, so please welcome. <laughs> And moderating the event tonight uh, is uh, Dr. Banu uh, Akdenesli. Uh, is, um, is, it, is it properly <coughs> pronounced? Akdenesli, right? Uh, Associate Professor of Communication at Northwestern University in Qatar. Uh, <laughs> She previously worked as a methodologist and analyst for the Pew Research Center's uh, journalism project in Washington, D.C. She is a research fellow at the University of Southern California Annenberg Center on Public Diplomacy. So without further ado, I now turn the floor to the panelists. Thank you, Dean. Um, it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be with uh, such uh, distinguished journalists and reporters. Um, uh, before I actually turn it over to Polly, um, I would like to briefly uh, provide a context uh, to tonight's um, sort of uh, discussion. Uh, as we know, uh, the Middle East has been a particular focus of global crisis uh, reporting yet. International coverage of these conflicts has historically been presented through a very Western perspective. Uh, the absence of Arab voices in the global public sphere has uh, created a discursive gap between the Middle East and the rest of the world. And the arrival of Al Jazeera English uh, initially was regarded as an attempt to bridge this gap by broadcasting discourses from and about the Arab world. So um, as tonight in your initial opening remarks, um, I know you all have very distinctive um, uh, backgrounds and what you have been doing throughout these years. Uh, would you please, um, as you're talking about your experiences, also talk about um, where you feel Al Jazeera English stands uh, in terms of the journalism practice at large? I mean, you are in the big leagues now with CNN and Deutsche Welle. So what are you bringing to the table now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Banu. Thank you, uh, Dean Dalal, uh, Your Excellency, distinguished guests. And uh, thank you, Mesa and the faculty um, and students at Georgetown and Northwestern for welcoming us here. It's an honor and privilege to be with you. Um, revolutionary, audacious, resilient, those are the words that come to mind when I think of Al Jazeera. Revolutionary because change was Al Jazeera's raison d'etre when it was launched in 1996. Al Jazeera Arabic first and later Al Jazeera English. And change is what Al Jazeera brought to the Arab media landscape. Before Al Jazeera, media in the Middle East was one perspective, government controlled television channels that preferred soap operas to news. Al Jazeera's launch created, uh, opened the Arab world and launched the Arab world into the global media landscape. Until then, Western media had controlled the narrative. Western media had told Arab viewers about their stories, their issues, and their region. The launch of Al Jazeera changed that. And in the 21 years now, more than 21 years since the channel was launched, we've seen 
uh, a number of television channels flourish in the region. We've seen the Emirati and Saudi answer to Al Jazeera, and even more recently, we've seen the Israeli answer to Al Jazeera with I-24 News. Revolutionary also, because Al Jazeera was one of the very, very first news organizations to embrace social media as a platform, a new platform for news gathering and storytelling. And we first saw the power of social media, the power of Facebook and Twitter during the 2008-2009 Gaza war. Uh, not only was Al Jazeera the only organization to have correspondence on the ground within Gaza, it was also the very first news channel in the world to live tweet the war minute by minute uh, with the handle, I think it was AJ Gaza on Twitter at the time. And of course, as the Arab Spring unfolded, social media played an even bigger role uh, in Al Jazeera's coverage of the event because it had direct access to the people. And it helped amplify voices that often were not heard in this region. Now, I want to make an important point here about the words revolutionary and revolution. Al Jazeera's mission is not to transform political systems or transform this region. That is not our mission. We are journalists, we're not activists. The people are who change, are who lead the revolutions. We are just the medium that they use to make their voices heard. I think it's a very important point to make because there's been a lot of debate about Al Jazeera's role in the transformation of political systems. And I think all my colleagues here would agree that as journalists, our mission really is not, we're not in the work of transforming political systems. Now, uh, the term audacious. Audacious because Al Jazeera has dared to go where no other television channel in this region has dared to go. Al Jazeera has aired voices in this region that have historically been censored. In the early days of Al Jazeera Arabic, I think they, they shocked a lot of viewers in this region locally by presenting Israelis speaking Hebrew on Arabic television for the very first time. And also on the other side, in the West, Al Jazeera was criticized, not just in the West in fact, even by countries, some countries in this region, for airing audio and video messages from Osama bin Laden. Let me tell you that in journalism, when both sides are critical of your coverage, then it means you're doing something right. That's the highest distinction for us. When both sides are not happy with what you say or what you air, then you must be doing something right. Uh, resilient, because no other television network has come under more scrutiny and under more attack than Al Jazeera in these past 21 years for Al Jazeera Arabic and, and more than 11 for Al Jazeera English. Our bureaus overseas have been ransacked or even bombed, like in Iraq in 2003 and Afghanistan in 2001. Our journalists have been killed while doing their jobs. They have been arrested, intimidated. But yet we continue to tell the story because it's our duty as journalists to continue telling the story. My colleague Jamal here, you mentioned uh, the flotilla, was on board the Mavi Mamra when it came under attack in 2010 by Israeli security forces. He was on the top deck broadcasting live and continued to do so throughout the raid and only stopped when communications were cut and he was arrested by the Israeli forces. That's an example of courageous journalism. You tell the story until you are physically not able to. Now, in this region, of course, there's been a lot of criticism of our work. Our, you know, several bureaus in the region were not able to broadcast from several countries, from Egypt, from uh, Yemen, from Syria. But we continue to do the job as uh, fairly and, and um, impartially as we can. It's not always easy, especially when, when the other side won't speak to you. But as journalists, it's our role to give all sides a share of our airtime, and we try to do that. We continue to do that as best as we can today, even in the circumstances sometimes that we find ourselves in. And uh, I, I was talking about resilience, right? Uh, so I, I just want to tell you a bit about my experience with Al Jazeera, just a little bit, to give you a background, uh, really. I, 
I began my career with Al Jazeera in the summer of 2010 when uh, the, the network's, uh, exper the network's uh, experience and its solid reputation was already established. So for me, coming from a region of the world where Western media had always told us our story, this was really a dream opportunity. And it was even more humbling to join Al Jazeera uh, on the eve of the first Arab Spring protests. I remember vividly being in the presenter's chair uh, in January of 2011 when Ben Ali stepped down as Tunisia's president. It was really a defining moment for this region. And what followed for us was months of a whirlwind coverage of the events from uh, you know, the streets of Tunisia to Cairo, Sahari Square, to the battlefields of Yemen, uh, Libya, and of course the continuing crisis in Syria. Being in the newsroom at that time was one of the most exciting experiences, I think, for us as journalists. Because you came in and you never wanted to leave, especially on Fridays after prayers, because that's when people would take to the streets to protest. And that's when people wanted to have their voices heard. And we gave them that platform. People who, in the past, weren't able to have their voices heard on Arab television or Arab media in general. Um, so it was really a humbling experience for me, uh, working with people like Jamal who were on the ground in the thick of the action, but also for us, I mean, you would sit there for hours on end, very often with little script, speaking to the correspondents and the guests on the ground, but you kept going because we knew that we were witnessing something very, very important for this region. Whether or not it was successful is another debate, of course. Um, so I just want to tell you a bit more then about, um, you know, the, the benefits and uh, you know what I find the most enriching, uh, when we, where we do things differently at Al Jazeera, where Al Jazeera has been revolutionary, and even not just in this region, in fact. I think when you look at the global media landscape, Al Jazeera is, is you know, one of the very few organizations that covers uh, regions of the world, remote regions of the world, where other global news giants like the BBC or CNN won't venture to because there's no interest among their audiences. Uh, our mission is to give a voice to the voiceless. So we will go to the most remote parts of Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and beyond. And what I find the most enriching is that even after the euphoria over a particular story dies down and the focus shifts to something else, we stay. We stay to continue telling the story. We have a network of correspondents from different countries who speak different languages who live and breathe the stories they cover. They are there, they know the complexities, the intricacies, and understand it. They're not just flown in and out. And that's really important when you're covering a story, to have someone on the ground who knows, who has experienced, who's lived the story. And those are the people I think that I have learned from the most in my uh, now almost eight years at Al Jazeera. Now, of course, everything is not rosy. You will know that. As you know, Al Jazeera has emerged as a central player in the current crisis that's uh, you know, unfolding in the Gulf. And the closing of the network was one of the 13 demands made by the blockading countries. Now, no respectable journalist, I think, wants to be at the center of a story they're covering. It's impossible, it's very hard. A lot of people have asked us, how do you stay objective when you're covering stories that are critical of Al Jazeera, when your very existence is, is under threat? Well, because we're journalists, we try to stay objective as much as we can. And it's not easy, it's not always easy, but we have to do our job in a fair way, as impartially as we can, and, and continue to do it to this day, even though it's not always easy. So, uh, you know, we, we, we are determined to continue this courageous journalism, I think. And at the end of the day, as we say, we are not the enemy, we are not committing a crime. We strongly believe that we are the voice of the people, really, and our job, our role, is to empower them with knowledge. And I think Al Jazeera has done that in the last you know, 21 years. Thank you. Is this hot? Okay. Um, I thank you fully. I, I really uh, concur and agree with your remarks, and I thank you, Professor, for moderating this, and Jamal, and it's very honored, I'm honored to be on this panel with you guys, and 
Dean Dalal, thank you again uh, for, for organizing this along with Haya and all the other students um, who are here for the Mesa conference. Um, I was remarking uh, before this began that um, I, I'm a 2003 graduate of Georgetown from DC and I used to attend, it was called Mesa, not with two S's, Middle East Students Association. And um, I remember very vigorous debates on campus in 2002 and three, um, post 9-11 in the run up to the Iraq war. And um, I learned a lot from teach-ins and from, um, from lectures and conferences that Georgetown had then um, when Dean DeLaw saw me as a broke grad student. So I'm, I'm very um, humbled and honored to see this tradition continue here in Doha and, and flattered that um, I would be included in uh, tonight's discussion. So I've, I've been asked to talk about um, how Jazeera has transformed this region and I remarked to Foley that I'm mildly uncomfortable with that because I feel like um, if, if you're the chef and the soup taster, it's kind of unfair and I think it's probably best that other people criticize our work and I just get on with making it. Um, but I, I definitely can talk about how Al Jazeera has um, transformed me and how um, some of our, our projects and some of the spaces that Al Jazeera has allowed us um, boldly to move into has transformed journalism. Um, so I, I started out working for Jazeera in 2006 when I was in DC. Um, I was at a Middle, a Middle East Institute think tank and um, I began as a part-time analyst. And um, a year later, I, I got the bug and I said, I want to learn how to make TV. I want to do it. Um, and they kept saying, well, you got to go to Doha and learn how. That's, everything's done out of Doha. And um, a year later, that's, that's what I did. I, I um, uh, packed up my things and I moved here. And I, at, you know, just before my 30th birthday, um, became a TV producer. And um, I would come into the newsroom and the meetings were as diverse as this panel, uh, Egyptian Brit, um, an American of mixed European descent from the Rust Belt of America, and French um, citizens by way of Gu uh, Guinea. And I mean, that's, that was our newsroom. It's like the United Nations. I and mean, we have 50 nationalities, um, hundreds of voices, and we would thrash out in our morning editorial meeting what's the most important thing that our audience needs to know about in our upcoming news hour, and then we'd crack on and we'd make the news. Um, I definitely, um, through that process, starting out at the, um, at the producer-reporter um, uh, phase of my career, learned how to tell stories that are um, broad enough that around the world people will find meaning in it, no matter uh, where they're from or what socioeconomic status they have. Um, I definitely appreciated um, the distinction of Al Jazeera that we covered things like Somalia, Yemen, Gaza, which aren't sponsored by Rolex, and which most American networks don't care about and don't deploy correspondence to. Um, in deploying to war zones, I, I you know, experienced the way that we tell the story of war, not as cheerleading on behalf of the Pentagon or whoever the parties are, but on um, you know, who are the, the people that are victims of this war. And you know the, the process and the experience humbled me. Um, in, in around 2010, um, I was part of a project that um, saw the, the, the seeds planted for an investigative unit. I'm gonna talk about um, that experience briefly, um, but I want to um, talk about the importance of editorial space. And it was editorial space that Al Jazeera gave um, myself and a group of journalists that no other Arab broadcaster until now has had. Um, and I think that that's a shame. I think there could be a lot of room for uh, investigative journalism in the Arab world that doesn't exist. Um, and I commend Al Jazeera for taking us in that direction. The editorial space that, <clears throat> that I'm going to refer to were three projects a few years apart under three different leaders. So we've had, um, when I joined the network, the director general was a, a gentleman named Wada Khanfar, and um, he was editorial um, day and night. His left eye was on Al Jazeera English, and his right eye was on Al Jazeera Arabic. And it was uh, he was a thrilling boss to have. And uh, one time, I'm, I was coming back from a trip to Palestine, and I had a source provide me with a laptop that had a lot more than his family vacation photos on it. it had an entire archive of all the 
um, secret negotiating minute, meeting minutes between Israelis and Palestinians from 2000 to 2010. And um, when I brought it to Doha and I started to go through it, I remember it was August and it was the first few nights of Ramadan. And um, I mean, I couldn't sleep day or night. I was reading this laptop. I was mining through the documents and, and weighing what, what it was that I had you know, been entrusted with. And in any newsroom, um, particular when you're not reporting the news, but you're breaking it and you're presenting things that no one else possesses, people are gonna clam up. They, you know, they're, they're scared. They're, you know, what, what is this? Is this, you know, this could get us into trouble. Are, you know, are, these, are these documents made up? These are all legit ed editorial questions, obviously. Um, I had found it problematic to get it taken seriously, but in, in Jazeera, not unlike um, at Georgetown or, or any other place where you know, free debate and argument is allowed, eventually if you crack on and you make your argument to enough people, someone will listen. And I found uh, Wada Khanfar at a men's clothing store near Al Jay to fly over. I have no idea if he was shopping there, but that's where he was. And he told me, come and bring this laptop. And so there, in a parking lot in front of the, the supermarket and the Kentucky Fried Chicken, I opened up my laptop, and I'm like, do you see what I'm talking about? And he said to me, from tomorrow, you work out of my office. I will take care of the rest. You work out of my office. And what that came to mean was you work out of a townhouse here in Doha, and we, we'd set up shop in this um, obscure place in Defna. And... Um, we built a team of, of, of experts, of journalists, to mine through these documents, which included the secret concessions that the Palestinian Authority was prepared to make on Jerusalem, refugees, borders, security. Um, remarkably candid inside the room. They read like FBI wiretaps. Um, and and while, while the team that we assembled was going through this, I was going around the world meeting other people, corroborating the data, getting other laptops, getting other thumb drives cross-checking to make sure, and I, I, I was getting more information in the process. This was a territory that the network wasn't used to doing, but there's a first for everything. And we were, you know, we, were, we didn't have a budget, we didn't have a cost center, all these internal bureaucratic things. We we're just figuring it out on the fly. And um, when we released the Palestine Papers in January 2011, um, four days of coverage along with The Guardian, it disrupted the news cycle. It, brought all these secret discussions to the fore. It resulted in a very serious debate amongst Palestinians over the fate of their national movement and what leaders were willing to do behind their backs. You know, there's a big gulf, a gap between what they were saying publicly and what they were negotiating privately. And we had, we had put every document online. I mean, we, we, you know, this is not something in the era of WikiLeaks. Jazeera, we hadn't partaken in that up until that point. And this was, I gotta say, one of the most exciting, incredible experiences because um, it was a first, and it, it, it augured well for a second, um, a second experience uh, under a different DG. This was Sheikh Ahmed bin Jassim, who came um, in 2000, end of 2011, and um, he was not a journalist, but my God, he had instincts. And when he um, saw a story, he would latch onto it like a junkyard dog and encourage us to pursue it, pursue it, pursue it. And such was the case when after a, um, a series of meetings with Suha Arafat, she had provided um, the late Yasser Arafat's medical files to us. And you know, there was some in the network who wanted to just publish it and be over with it. And there was, again, editorial space, strategic patience that Sheikh Ahmed had. And he said, Clayton, you build your team. You guys go off and you work on this. That's exactly what we did. We went and we consulted experts who were French doctors because these were files in French. We uh, then I, I, I must have gone to Malta five, six times um, and to a point where Mrs. Arafat agreed to give me um, the bag of Yasser Arafat's last belongings that accompanied him to a hospital in France where he died. And inside that bag was his clothes that he wore when he expired and um, his medicines, um, a variety of things that he had taken to him um, prior to being in, in a hospital. And at that moment, um, his hat, his glasses, his medicines, the idea registered that we should find someone with a forensic background to go through this because the French doctors in this secret medical report clearly don't know what killed him. 
they did test for some poisons. Um, but this isn't the stuff that you can just, you know, ring up someone off of, you know, uh, the yellow pages and say, hey, have a look at this. It, it required someone with a specific discipline. So I spent a lot of time going around the world researching who are the best, you know, f forensic cold case investigators, uh, both for a toxicology perspective, um, but also, you know, the various disciplines that were included in his medical file. Um, we found a laboratory in Switzerland used by the United Nations in Lausanne, delivered all of the, a, um, the effects and files to those scientists, and I'm sure some of them regretted it because they agreed to do it for free. They were very expensive tests. Um, in the end, they didn't find any conventional poisons, but when they shared it with their radiological colleagues, they found polonium-210. And they found polonium-210 in a urine and blood stain from Arafat's underwear and his hat, which was on his head, a blood stain about three quarter of an inch diameter, which had reactor made polonium. So that was big news in the summer of 2012 when it aired, and it could have ended there. But as Sheikh Ahmed said to me, Clayton, no guts, no glory. We continued this story. Suha Arafat went to a French prosecutor. They got a court order to exhume Yasser Arafat's body, and I confess, I was, I mean, pins and needles. What happens if Yasser Arafat gets dug up and they find nothing? Polonium decays by 50% every 138 days. That was a possibility. Eight years had passed between his death and the exhumation. And the Swiss found in his skeletal remains between 18 and 36 times the amount of polonium ever measured in a human being on planet Earth. And they've been measuring human carcasses since the 1960s. Yet there were some that said he's not poisoned, this was the, the French position, this was the Russian position, but the Swiss don't lie. This is the calibrating laboratory in Europe that um, they calibrate the nuclear instruments used by other laboratories who test such things. These controversies, um, the Palestine papers, um, people were burning effigies of Qatar's emir, security goons ransacked our Ramallah bureau, um, they thought that the Arafat investigation was done to benefit Hamas and stir up controversy between Israel and disrupt the peace process. Everyone assigns a motive when you do these controversies. And for some who are politically, okay, um, nervous, it's just easier not to do them. But this is an important, these, both of these were important pieces of Middle East history. Um, Yasser Arafat being a transformative figure, love him or hate him, he was the leader of the Palestinian cause, and he died a very suspicious death. And um, for the Arab media to have uh, been involved in breaking this story and putting um, resources behind investigations, I think was a great credit upon Al Jazeera. We did this, a similar um, expose in 2015. Um, it was called the Spy Cables. Um, I had received uh, a digital leak of intelligence documents from South Africa. That included intelligence cables from Britain's MI6, America's CIA, the Russian SVR, GRU. Um, these were all liaison cables sent from various spy agencies to the South Africans. And it, it I mean, it was a, a mix and a mash. It, we had to do the same thing. We had to assemble a team. We had to verify the documents. Um, and these just weren't any documents. Um, one of them went viral around the world. Um, if you remember Benjamin Netanyahu went to Washington, D.C to um, speak before the Congress of the United Nations and declare that Iran was this close to a nuclear bomb and he had this chart, it was very cartoon-like, it made 100 memes on the internet. And here we had a, a Mossad top secret cable drafted just two weeks before that trip saying Mossad's assessment is that Iran is nowhere near enrichment and they're not even trying to make a bomb. So there's a, a, a big consonance between Netanyahu scaremongering for the entire United States on the floor of the House and the floor of the United Nations, and his own intelligence service saying, relax, nothing, nothing to worry about here. So um, when this, these were 17 news packages we put together, and they were, like I said, a hodgepodge of a variety of different issues. And I sh we screened them for the acting director general, Mustafa Sawag, and it was, I mean, the implication was clear. We're, we're gonna upset quite a lot of intelligence services by doxing them and putting these cables out. And he didn't bat an eye, he said, do it. I like it, good, good luck. So this editorial space to, to take these risks has allowed Jazeera 
and allowed the space of what I've been involved in, which is investigations, to diversify the genre of what our journalists are known for. For sure, we've, we've changed the, the landscape with our breaking news being there in Kabul and in Iraq and on the Mavi Marmara when you know, special forces are fast roping down. I mean, we, we, we do the live like no one else in this part of the world. But to tell stories that people would otherwise not like to see the light of day is only um, possible because of the space that our leadership has given us. And um, uh, with that, I, I'll, I'll leave it to Jamal and, and thank you again, everyone, for, uh, for coming here tonight and to listen to us. Assalamu alaikum, good evening, everyone. Thank you for making me have to follow up on uh, 007 here. <laughs> it's not uh, an easy one. Um, I do, I'm going to touch a bit on uh, my personal experience with uh, Al Jazeera, um, but also the role I think I want to talk about uh, a bit more specifically in what I view our role and more importantly what our duty uh, is. Um, I joined Al Jazeera in 2006 as one of the uh, launch team for the English Channel. Um, I was born in Scotland, grew up in London. Never in my life did I ever want to be a journalist. Um, it was never something that I aspired towards. I stumbled across this job, actually. Um, and growing up in London as somebody from uh, immigrant parents, uh, my family originally are from uh, Egypt, um, Al Jazeera for me was a source of my identity, Al Jazeera Arabic. So we grew up watching Al Jazeera Arabic. It was how we connected with our homeland, how we connected with the ideas uh, that were circulating in societies, um, knowing what was going on, just so we are aware of what was happening. And it was also um, uh, something that I had to do so I can learn Arabic. Um, otherwise, my, my parents would get very upset. Um, so for me, when the idea came for an English channel to be launched, and I was approached to, uh, initially I was approached to speak, Al Jazeera does an annual forum, so in 2006 I was asked to, to give a, a presentation there, and then after the presentation, I guess what I said, some of it might have made sense, so they said, well, why don't you come and help us with this uh, launch of this channel? Um, I was more interested about serving the idea of Al Jazeera as an idea without realizing the role specifically in terms of journalism if that makes sense. But in reality, it became one and the same for me, and this is it. Ultimately, and I'm sure you will know and agree with me here more than anybody or any other audience, knowledge is power. You cannot have a society which uh, is able to decide its own destiny, which is able to go on and continue, which is able to be productive in any which way, be it economic, social, cultural, without knowledge. And I think this is what we aspire towards. And to touch upon what Foley and both, uh, both Foley and Clayton spoke about, this is, for me, the most important thing. So when we talk about transforming, yes, Al Jazeera was never set out to ensure that a specific political party existed or didn't exist. It didn't set out as a, as a, a vision to ensure that you had a monarchy or a republic in any country. The idea behind it was to serve in providing one of the most basic tenets of human rights, which is the right to be informed, the right to know. And I think, as maybe abstract or basic as that may sound, depending on how you look at it, it is the most important thing that we need to understand when we either assess Al Jazeera or assess the idea of a free press specifically in this day and age. Now, it's no uh, uh, secret, especially from my country of origin, Egypt, uh, and the Arab world generally, unfortunately, our societies are not the most educated. And be it in terms of literacy levels or even those who graduate and have degrees and so forth, in terms of actual intelligence. You know, in, in Egypt, a lot of my, my, uh, my relatives, they would get, you know, uh, they have their, their equivalent of GCSEs or, or A-levels. Uh, for those from the UK, I don't know in the US what you have prior to university. Um, but they would get like 99.9% .9 and 100%. And I, how on earth is that possible? You can barely cross the road without getting hit. And it's because they would just like revise everything and study it. But you actually ask them about genuine I issues, it wasn't there. 
So when Al Jazeera Arabic first launched, you suddenly had a provision or a platform for people to be informed about women's rights, for example, in Saudi Arabia, or for people to be informed about why there is high level of unemployment in places, or why there was corruption in certain countries. And then they would start questioning. So why is it that I'm told as an Arab that I have to accept this idea of stability and security in order to survive when other countries don't settle for that? Other societies actually aspire to have their voices heard, to ask questions, to ask why is it that a 30-year-old doctor who's graduated has to work as a taxi driver at night to make ends meet. To talk about some of the experiences, um, for me, two of the most life-changing experiences for me, one was uh, my first, maybe say, big story that I did, which was on board the, uh, the Turkish aid ship that was going to Gaza. But one that was a lot closer to home was reporting on the Arab Spring, or what I like to call the Arab Uprising, that took place in Egypt. I landed in Egypt on January 26th. January 25th, I was, I was in Doha, and I remember watching what was happening in the evening. The day before was actually the Palestine papers that were, were released, and I, uh, we were still kind of on a high on that. Um, January 26th, I w walked into the newsroom, and I, I told the guys, I said, I'm going to Egypt, very simply. They said, well, we've got teams. I said, either I go, or I go. Like, it's not, you know, there's something major going on, I don't want to be part of it. Uh, thankfully, I went that evening, and the interest, so I, I went to, when I got to Cairo, obviously, everybody was, was, was focusing on Cairo as the capital, but one of the things that helped us, because of the local knowledge, uh, my idea in the beginning was to go to Egypt's third city, which is the Suez. Uh, there were the first two people who were killed, and for me, I thought it was a lot more important to start off there to get the stories of why are these people, you know, uh, willing to sacrifice their lives. I spent a few days there. Uh, January 28th was what was called the Friday of Rage. Essentially, the police were run over. Some of them withdrew. And suddenly, the day after, you're in a street where it's like one of these Armageddon films. You know, there's people looting in the street. There's chaos and so forth. And you're wondering what's going on. And then you hear the army rolling and stuff. And I remember we were standing there. And I suddenly saw uh, outside, if you can call it the hotel we were staying at, the place where we were sleeping a van was driving around and it had on it a bed sheet on the back of it and it was written on it, uh, whoever speaks to Al Jazeera will cut off their tongue, right? Now, of course that's worrying because everyone wants to have their tongue intact, but also because it was interesting in the sense that, okay, why Al Jazeera? We never, we never, there was no promo on Al Jazeera before January 25th saying, hey Egyptians, get to the streets. There was no program that was entrusted to try and mobilize Egyptians to go on protest. But what there was for consistent uh, uh, years before that, there was coverage of the things that the Egyptian government didn't want people to see. So people started becoming informed. They started having that knowledge, which began to empower them. Interestingly enough here, and this is to come back to all the criticism that we get, and I, for me, People think I'm a bit uh, over-defensive, but I, I have no qualms about this. During the Arab Spring, during specifically in Egypt, the amount of people within the police or the army or the National Democratic Party, which was uh, ironically called uh, Mubarak's party, um, that I called personally to try and get their opinion on it was nonstop. We would try and guess everybody, every side. They would either refuse or uh, not answer or so forth. That was their prerogative. But even despite the fact that we had Mubarak thugs going after us and uh, essentially trying to kill us or th th threatening our lives, we would still hold true to the ideals that Foley spoke about or to the uh, principles that Al Jazeera was founded on of getting the opinion and the other opinion. And that was our job. Fast forward now to another important uh, development in what is an uncertain, what, what are we saying, uncertain? Uncertainty and stability and cohesion. We've seen the uncertainty in the Middle East, by the way. We still haven't seen the other two. Um, but you come to the GCC now, the GCC crisis of what's going on. Now, 
we are or we have been at the center of the story. And yes, we're not happy about being at the center of the story because we'd much rather actually focus on reporting it. The question is what, what happens a lot of the times, and in the very beginning I had friends from The Guardian and uh, Sky News in the UK, not, not uh, the one in Abu Dhabi, and others, uh, asking, um, asking us, you know, so what's your response to this? And I would always find it very peculiar because I would say, did you guys ever stop and think why are they asking to shut down Al Jazeera? Like really, why? Forget about the whole kind of spiel of sponsoring terrorism and whatever, because they know, I mean, these are fellow journalists that would be in press conferences with us, that would see us on the ground reporting and so forth. Why is it that Al Jazeera is such an issue? And in that question lies the answer to the importance, I would say, a degree before sacred role that journalists play in terms of ensuring that right of information and the empowering of people. Similar to, if you don't mind, I know you, you've all studied for years to get your PhDs and my parents are academics and my mother would literally hit me if she heard me say this. Similar to university professors who try and educate people. That you, you, the idea is to try and give them the tools to know what's going on, to be able to make that informed de decision. So when you have a crisis that is now the GCC crisis, you have entire countries, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, devoting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, to PR campaigns, to uh, f essentially set up channels that are made just to trash us, then you start questioning why. Since when was Saudi Arabia a beacon of democracy or freedom to judge what Al Jazeera's standard, editorial standard of integrity is? And here again, this is something that's important because then people will start questioning, well then, that means you are taking a side in this. My only side is to be able to report freely whether that is something you like or you don't like, so long as I'm doing it accurately. Incidentally, and again, we, we always mention this, I personally have reported on uh, many of the, uh, uh, I would say, r r justly critical uh, practices that occur here in terms of migrant workers. And never have I had an issue. I sat down with the Minister of Labor, I remember a few years ago when um, the first kind of, which turned out to be a sponsored campaign against Qatar, but nonetheless, there was still merit in the story. I sat down with the Minister of Labor. There was nobody who said you can't ask questions about it. Nobody who said they don't want. Now, this is something again that's important. Obviously, and I'm not naive into thinking that there aren't political let's say, uh, uh, accompaniments to uh, institutions or to other things. That is the case from the BBC to CNN to anybody. If they exist and it's natural that uh, anybody who is going to invest in something, while they may have a general goal that I agree with and I, I, I adhere to, will have other benefits or considerations to take into account. Anybody who doesn't realize that is fooling themselves before anything. But the the, the important question is what role do we play? What role should we play? And how do we preserve that role and ensure that we perform it to the best possible standard? As I mentioned, for me, I believe the role is to <coughs> allow for information to uh, travel from A to B, from where something happens to the people who should or want to know about it. How we do that, thankfully, I think there's a practical element to this to go off just a little bit on the, I think one of the other things which people fail to talk about in terms of Al Jazeera is what we've invested, again, Foley mentioned this, and even Clayton in terms of setting up investigation in the investigative unit, but also in terms of being at the forefront in terms of the digital platforms, social media platforms, and so forth. We did a lot before anybody else in terms of Facebook Lives, in terms of Twitter, in terms of the Snapchat channels, we have other things that are coming out that really were cutting edge to ensure that it was provided to people. And I, again, some of that was out of innovation and some of it was out of necessity in that we had countries, again, militaries, like in Egypt, using military equipment rather than to intercept possible rockets that would be landing on the ground to try and uh, jam our satellite networks. So we had to start thinking out of the box, how do we ensure that people uh, 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 will be able to, to, to receive that information uh, and so forth. So 
In summation, I think the idea of people sometimes they cower or maybe they get a bit nervous when you hear these ideas, putting in the same sentence, you know, journalists in transformation. But I, I don't think there is anything to shy away from that. I think it's very important just to be confident about what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and to be very clear. Of course, by the way, when I say all of this, we've got things wrong in the past. We, we, everybody does. But there's a difference between you making a mistake, owning up to it, and making sure you don't repeat it, to other channels that purposefully invest and spend time and money to actually spread things intentionally wrong in order to either mislead uh, people or disinform them. And this is why I, m m my response always is people can criticize Al Jazeera for many different things, but what they cannot criticize them for is the intention we have when we come to do things, the integrity that we try and apply and we do our utmost uh, to it, and the fearlessness that is instilled on us the moment we walk through that door until we leave. Bear in mind, from George Bush, who wanted to bomb us, to the Egyptian prison cells that I've gone through and others in my uh, uh, colleagues have, to Israeli cells and to, to everything else. So I think our role is something that is extremely important. I wish that there were other institutions that would do the same. I'm sure there are in terms of independent journalists that do that and maybe other smaller networks. But hopefully, if we want to get to the bit of stability and cohesion that we all aspire to have this region in, it needs more access to information, it needs protection of uh, journalists, and it needs more freedom. Um, before turning it over to the audience, um, I have a one um, more question, one last question for me as a moderator, and um, as a media scholar, I have to ask this, of course, um, which kind of brings me to the whole. Uh, that was one, you know, common theme in all of your um, introduction speeches, uh, which was related to the social media aspect of it. At Northwestern, we have um, yearly studies that we do. It's a very uh, big uh, study, the Middle East uh, media use and the Middle East studies. And we've been tracking media uh, use in the region uh, since 2013. And we always find good, new, good actually, data on uh, Al Jazeera as well. So good news for you guys. You are one of the leading networks here in terms of uh, people, where people go to get their news, uh, both online and um, both for AJ English and AJ uh, Arabic as well, both for young people and for the older generation. Uh, but one thing, of course, what we've seen is that in terms of social media, uh, there is a big increase in terms of use and people are going there increasingly for their um, news. Uh, but with the GCC crisis, what we've seen, uh, and this has been not only for here in this area, but universally as well, this was an issue with the 2016 US elections as well, the issue of fake news and bots. Um, so as an institution, how are you dealing with this issue? I want to tell you about bots because um, I don't know if anybody saw um, a few days ago I was in London uh, reporting on the, the, the visit of the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, I asked him a question, it went online, it went a bit viral. I suddenly had literally, I was just telling them 4,000 tweets at me in a, in a few minutes, or a few hours rather, a couple of hours. Out of those 4,000, like 99% were just insults. But you could tell that half of them were fake accounts that were created. Um, the Saudis and some other, even in Egypt and, and some countries, are actually uh, investing in uh, people to set up these fake accounts in order so you can get certain hashtags trending and so it can appear that people are questioning that generates interest. So it is something that is very much existent and uh, it is a dangerous thing because aside from uh, trying to uh, verify whether something is correct or not in terms of information, Sometimes something appears bigger than it really is because you suddenly have like a million tweets about something, but really, firstly, they're not a million people, and then secondly, okay, you know, what's at the, the source of this? Um, we have uh, obviously our online division, which deals with just the basic, what the, the standard website rather, and then also uh, the social media accounts, but we also have like an incubation unit which uh, looks in terms of trying to uh, advance the, leading, uh, the latest uh, cutting edge technology and, and, and so forth. I don't think anybody until now, from news channels or even from, from, from governments, have been able to figure out uh, a way to uh, 
uh, disseminate clearly and to ensure that when fake news is out, it, it doesn't spread like wildfire. Because the easiest thing, very simply, uh, one of the interesting things actually to, to show you, I mean, the man's the other side. I, I received um, a video a couple of days ago from a friend of mine claiming that a Saudi prince had committed suicide in an airport in London and it showed this guy jumping off a balcony. The airport was in the US, the video was two weeks before and it was all fake. But the easiest thing is that you get these things, it all looks pretty cool, you either like, like it or retweet it or forward it on WhatsApp and then because nobody wants to verify it, because it's, if it's entitled in a way, it becomes catchy and, and so forth. And I think there is a, a, an, a journalist lying in everybody in that everybody wants to be the person who breaks the news, right? Even if you're, if you're working in another field, you want to be the person who, who said that. Um, so I think that is something uh, dangerous. But I guess with, every t with everything, nothing is perfect. So there is also a very, very positive side to these digital platforms in that they are the alternative when com countries and governments try and you know, switch up transmission satellites when journalists are locked up and therefore you have these citizen journalists. Mm -hmm. A big part of it, just very quickly, would be to also there is a responsibility, and I don't mean to kind of, you know, pass the back a bit, but there is a responsibility to the public to verify. So when you read something, double check, see where it's coming from, see if you can verify. Obviously, from a journalistic perspective, we should be doing our best to ensure that we have those credible sources and so forth. But I think people should be reasonable enough also to, to look for it. Yeah. yeah, when it comes to breaking news stories, of course, because that's where the story actually. Uh, comes up first, and you have to verify, double check, and even the pictures they sent you. If there's an earthquake or a bombing somewhere, we have a team, we have a big social media department at Al Jazeera that checks these pictures before we put them to air, you know? Sometimes it'll say, oh, we have the, the, the photos of that bombing or video of that bombing uh, from Iraq or oh, that's just happened now. But we have to be very careful. We can't just put it up there, you know? We have a responsibility, as Jamal says, to our audience. Uh, and, and it's a very, sometimes, sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we have put pictures up or video up that turned out to be from a different country or a, di or a different time. And when that happens, you have to admit to your mistakes, of course. It's a, very, it's a very difficult balancing act. There's no doubt about it. But I want to talk about, you know, the, 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 the social, an, another aspect of all this is that we increasingly have more audience engagement now through social media. We have, I, I present a show called The News Grid, which is an interactive show where viewers have the chance to directly uh, uh, comment or ask questions. And I think this is a, a very important thing because uh, you know, a couple of years ago, viewers, e even if they had uh, you know, a certain comment or reaction to a story, they wouldn't be able to communicate it right away. And I think social media has helped us in this way to diversify also the way we broadcast and the way we create programming. And it's, uh, we're increasingly using it on Al Jazeera. Yeah. I would just, I would actually, uh, mm -hmm. switch it off. There we go, hello? No? No, Testing, okay. Uh, I, I would actually throw that question back to academia. <laughs> and I say that because um, only recent, I, I feel like we're still contemplating the effects of, let's just take Twitter for example. One friend said to me, this is like weaponized hate speech. Mm -hmm. Unrestrained, instant, people um, seeking things to revalidate their own opinion rather than fact. In fact, I, I read yesterday that as much as 70% of things that are um, retweeted and liked tend to be fake. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a way of people scratching that itch and feeling good about it and, and being in their own insular circle of people that also have that world view. And I think, frankly, um, when the First Amendment was put together by the, the framers um, and, and the Constitution of the United States I'm talking about allowed for free speech, it protected anonymous speech, right? So the, the ability of someone who has a beef um, with the government but doesn't want to be persecuted to post a document in the town square and sign it John Doe or submit it into a newspaper. I don't think the framers contemplated that someone, to borrow from Donald Trump, could be in their grandmother's basement <laughs> in Eastern Europe and make an algorithm on a supercomputer that could create one million such anonymous speech vehicles um, so that we would have that, that echo chamber that uh, Jamal was referring to of so, for, for example, if it's anti-Semitic views, which we saw during the 2016 election, 
and you, all these green frog faces on, on Twitter and all these make America great again uh, hashtags being reinforced from outside. So everyone thought that this speech is cool. Everyone's doing it. It's trending. And look how many, and these have, they have American names. It says Joe Smith from Oklahoma and he's got the flag and he's got his gun and his pickup truck. It's all bots created off Google. And so, you know, people that aren't as informed sit at home and say, okay, all right, these views are coming back into vogue. They, you know, like, you know, like um, pigeons following a breadcrumb, they follow the trail and they continue in this direction, unquestioning the origins of the source. Um, I, I feel like um, anonymous speech has to be rethought. And I'm not, you know, um, not to attack our constitution, but it wasn't envisaged back then that a Cray computer in some room could make you a million bots that could all of a sudden deploy and alter a debate and short notice. No one knows the origin or the control um, of, of that propaganda being put out. And um, yeah, it, it, it's normalized. We, we know um, that um, one of the intentions, according to Mueller's indictment of the 13 people from Russia, St. Petersburg, um, who he alleges were interfering in the 2016 election, that they were trying to turn Americans against blacks, Americans against Muslims, and um, to say that if Hillary Clinton won, that the security of the United States would be imperiled. Um, I'm not a Hillary Clinton fan, um, but I, I feel, uh, you know, I feel offended um, at this intrusion, and uh, no doubt the United States has tried to do this to other people, and probably they got out, outwitted at their own game. But I think that there should be a discussion, a set of norms. I know that Europe has looked at, um, or forget Europe, even in the United States, there's been cases to prosecute people for impersonating people on, on Twitter. New laws are being contemplated. Some sort of regulation. Europe, I think Italy was looking at passing a law to outlaw bots, um, the creation of bots. And so, I mean, yeah, I think we need to go back to the drawing board. I mean, we're, we're as journalists in the middle of it, and, and, and as Jamal said, we're bombarded by it. It's a necessary evil we all use, we all you know, rely on, but it's deeply flawed and it's deeply troubling the way it is now, in my view. Well, thank you. That was a very powerful um, moment, I think. Um, well, certainly, um, Al Jazeera has done a lot in transforming the media landscape in this uh, part of the world and at large. And uh, as an academic, we see Al Jazeera, the biggest soft power for Qatar. That's uh, one of the um, you know, um, points that I would like to make. And uh, thank you for a wonderful panel, for an invigorating discussion, for a wonderful dialogue uh, with um, our guests tonight. And I would like to thank George Shah for inviting me again. And I think uh, our conversation is going to uh, continue in the uh, room next door. Thank you. Thank you.